All right, now we're looking around the universe to find a, some signs of a creator or an evolver. Then we have beautiful objects that we observe in the sky. Here we have Andromeda galaxy, a disk-like assemblage of some billions of stars. Unbelievable. And so we see the star as an organized body. And then we see stars themselves organized into formations. Organized by the billions. How could that evolve? How did they get that way? Well, they didn't get that way in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. In fact, notice, in fact, oh, in fact, not if fact. Just fix that. Notice the statement by Jeffrey Burbage of the University of California, San Diego, writing in Scientific American. This was February 92, 1992. Wow. He says, <clears throat> we have no satisfactory theory of how galaxies and larger structures form. Galaxies cannot form by gravitational collapse in an expanding universe. Now, it's easy to make the calculations. We're told by evolutionists that the universe is expanding, and this is an outward dissipati dissipative, dissipative force, whereas you have to have them collected in an inward direction to get them organized. If you calculate the expansive and the attractive forces required, it proves that you just can't get stars and galaxies to form, given the laws of science. And yet, they, there they are. We see beautiful pictures like the Sombrero Galaxy, a tremendous organization of billions of stars. There they are. How do they get there? How do they get organized? Well, not in accord with the second law of thermodynamics. Martin Rees, a famous astrophysicist, is quoted in the Dallas Morning News in 1988. Wow, that's a long time ago. Saying, the most basic question about galaxies are still not understood. And today, still not understood. If galaxies didn't exist, we would have no problem explaining that fact. But they do. Compare a quotation from Dr. Pat Patton's notes that support this. He's so good in this, these, uh, these uh, videos. It seems that the more we learn about the basic laws of nature, the more these laws, those laws seem to tell us that the visible matter, the stuff we can see, shouldn't be arranged the way it is. There shouldn't be galaxies out there at all. And even if there are galaxies, they shouldn't be grouped together the way they are. The problem of explaining the existence of galaxies has proved to be one of the thorniest in cosmology. By all rights, they just shouldn't be there. Especially if, according to evolutionists, the universe is billions of years old and they had a chance to dissipate and go disorient, yet there they sit. It's hard to convey the frustration that this simple fact induces among scientists. Despite what they may read in the press, we still have no answer to the question of why the sky is full of galaxies, although we've succeeded in eliminating many wrong answers. It's supposed to be dissipated already, billions of years. And they're still hanging up in those unique formations, like a sombrero. James Treffel. Same problem with stars, except multiplied a billion times. If you can get the material condensed enough, you can find gravitational collapse taking over. But how do you get it to that point? With stars, you can imagine that, but you can't get it to the point where it starts. And then with galaxies... You can calculate the amount of mass that ought to be there to hold it together, but better than 90% of the mass necessary to hold it together is unobserved. We can't find it. It's called by evolutionists the missing mass. And then we look at the formations like barred and spiraled galaxies. These straight bars of star formations, which appear to be dissecting the spiral galaxies, are amazing. I've seen pictures. If they have been spinning as long as we have, have, we have been told, told by evolutionists, that they've been spinning. That's organizational structure. 
that we see would wrap itself up according to Kepler's third law in just a few thousand years. We see the principle illustrated with spinning ice skaters. They hold their arms out. They spin more slowly and, as they pull the arms in, they spin faster. Likewise with these barred spiral galaxies, they are spinning very rapidly, more rapidly than evolutionist theories can account for. The interior would spin faster and the outer part would spin more slowly. And if you've got a bar through the middle, how in the world you get it there, they don't know. It would wrap itself up and self-destruct in just a few thousand years, not billions and billions of years. Yet, there they are. How do they get there? How do they stay there? Especially if the universe is billions of years old. Not only do we see organizational structure of stars within galaxies, but we see organizational structures of multiple galaxies themselves. And here we see a globular cluster of thousands, if not billions, of galaxies. And that is mind-boggling. The globular cluster of billions of galaxies, which are organizations of billions of stars, which are organizations of immense amounts of matter. I, I couldn't even begin to calculate. You'd never get finished adding. We see great organizations. How do you account for that by natural law? We, well, consider the struggle that's expressed in Discover Ma Magazine 1988 by Nobel Laureate. Uh, I don't have his name here. Al Alvin, I guess. Alvin, in an article entitled The Big Bang Never Happened. He says, for years, astrophysicists... Oh, here it is. Oh, he spelled his name. So they didn't get the name right. I don't know why. Oh, there must be an apostrophe or something. So, anyway, in an article entitled The Big Bang Never Happened, he says, for years, astrophysicists have invoked some kind of dark matter to explain why spiral ga galaxies rotate as fast as they do and why galaxy clusters do not fly apart, extra gravity needed to form the galaxies and clusters in the first place. So, Haynes Alfin, Nobel Laureate, he talks about the extra gravity needed to form the galaxies and clusters in the first place that can't account, they can't account for. The mass is missing that would be necessary to produce that extra gravity. They rotate too fast. Why don't they fly apart? They should. How do you get them to form in the first place? Here we are told we are looking at some one million galaxies and we see organizational structure that ties these galaxies together. And we're told about the Great Wall, which expands over hundreds of millions of light years, even billions of light years. The Big Bang that has been proposed as an explanation cannot begin to account for it. Consider the statement by a number of leading astronomers in the world. Art, Burbage, Hoyle, and others. The Big Bang model offers a universe created in a smooth, featureless condition out of which a highly structured universe is nevertheless supposed to have evolved. Numerous attempts have been made to explain how this miracle is supposed to have happened, little more than ingenious hand-waving. Perhaps this is why they are called scenarios. So, Hart, Burbage, and Hoyle, and others in Nature wrote that. In the comment, they're just stories made up to try to explain it, ignoring the second law of thermodynamics, ignoring the attraction of mass, unless you imagine a lot of matter, 90% of which is missing. What you observe is highly organized structure, which is dissipating. So it's winding down. So maybe a all-powerful designer, creator designer. Can you imagine how powerful God is, yet he's so concerned about you and I as his children? Now that's precisely what the creationists would predict, but it is hardly what the evolutionists would predict. Some of them have faced it, although most of them do not. They are very practiced and professional at seeing the opposite of what they actually what's actually observed. What we observe is deterioration. We see organization there, but it's going downhill. And that's what the second law predicts. That's the most fundamental generalization scientists have ever been 
able to make about the universe. That's what we see. But they imagine just the opposite. Consider H.J. Lipson, professor of physics, University of Manchester, writing in Physics Bulletin. He says, I think, however, that we should go further than this and admit that the only accepted explanation is creation. I know that is anathema to physicists, as it is to me. He admits it. But we must not reject a theory that we do not like if the experimental evidence supports it. There you go. Here's an honest answer. H.J. Lipson. Okay, I think that makes sense. We're supposed to go by the facts, the experimental ed evidence. Consider the statement in fundamental, Fundamentals of Classical Thermodynamics, a textbook that just states what the necessary implications of these observations are. Quote, we see the second law of thermodynamics as a description of the prior and continuing work of a creator who also holds the answer to our future destiny and that of the universe. G. J. Van Wylen, Richard Sontag, Fundamentals of Classical Thermodynamics. <coughs> that comes from there. Now, this quotation, that's a brave statement made by who are by those who are writing textbooks who are authorities in the field. Compare several quotations from Dr. Patton's notes that corroborates this. <coughs> I think all suggested accounts of the origin of the solar system are subject to serious objections. The conclusion is the present state of the subject would be that the system cannot exist. Sir H. Jeffries, Cambridge, The Earth, article, 19, way back in 1970. These are still relevant. All of the hypotheses so far presented have failed or remain unproved when physical theory is properly applied. Fred Ripple, Harvard, orbiting, orbiting the Sun, that's in his article. It is far easier to explain why the moon shouldn't be there than to explain its existence. And Naft, Nafi Toksos, MIT, somebody from MIT, back in 81. The greatest puzzle is where all the order in the universe came from originally. How did the cosmos get wound up if the second law of thermodynamics predicts asymmetric unwinding toward disorder. Paul C. C. W. Davies, King's College, London University, second look. In any case, Dr. Baugh says in his work, the evolution is, pl is playing with an immediate observation that the universe is in somewhat, is somewhat in chaos, somewhat. He interprets this as the second law of thermodynamics, which states that everything is increasing in random order, from complex to less complex. This second law of thermodynamics dynamics demands that there had to be, have been a time in the past when everything was in perfect synchronization, that is, orchestral creation. Somebody designed that. You have to work backwards, reverse engineer. The first law of thermodynamics is one of energy conservation. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. So the second law of thermodynamics can basically be stated that in spite of this conservation, the first law, the energy available for useful work does decrease so that the universe can be said to be running down. Example, the sun's energy is dissipating by heat into the universe. The dissipation of raw energy into the universe, such as from the sun and how many other stars, is observed to cause a destructive devolving and not a constructive evolving effect. So everything is devolving and not evolving as can be observed. Henry Morris states in his book, Back to Genesis, 
evolutionists have a most amazing faith.